This is very much a rattle through the key changes in the PCR 15 and then a look at a couple of other topics, um, highlighting the draft contract regulations. The drafts were sent out um, by Cabinet Office towards the end of August and that consultation is running until the 18th of September. So we're going to touch on that very briefly and then highlighting a couple of points around trends and legal challenges. Time is very, very tight um, for the topics to cover, so I'm going to try and um, go through those as quickly as I can. I do welcome questions, so if there's something that's not clear, please do sort of interject, and I'll either try and deal with it if it's something that isn't otherwise set out in the slides, or I'll say where we're going to catch up with that as we move through. The session does sort of is based on a level of EU procurement understanding. So if there's anything that isn't making sense, again, please feel free to ask some questions. But the slides do assume that there is a working knowledge there of the obligations. So 2014 saw the new EU directives on the utilities, <coughs> concessions and public contracts. Obviously, for you guys in the audience, the utilities isn't really a set of regulations that you need to worry about. They're also being consulted on at the moment, though, just for information. 26th of February brought us the public contract regulations 2015. We were the first member state to bring those uh, bring through the directors into national legislation. These apply in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Scotland have been consulting over the summer on their draft regulations. So they have a slightly different approach um, north of the border. So they're not in force yet. Um, they're obviously implementing the same directives though. So they should be very similar in approach with some policy scope um, options that they may take a different approach upon. Government is continue, continuing to issue a large amount of guidance on the regulations. That's coming out through PPN, so Standard Procurement Policy Notes, and also through other Cabinet Office guidance. That's worth just being aware of because a lot of people will get updates and notifications around PPNs, but you're not necessarily getting the same notification from the same place on the Cabinet Office guidance. So it's worth just keeping an eye on the Cabinet Office website. They have a specific section around transposing the public procurement directives and they have all the different um, pieces of guidance listed out within there. Soft market testing. Um, I'm assuming that as organisations it's possibly something you already do as a matter of course. The directive and now the regulations are very clear that this is something that you have the right to do. It can be done. Obviously there's some nervousness around um, speaking to suppliers when you're about to enter into a procurement, whether that isn't something that causes an issue with the um, fairness or transparency of the process, not being unduly influenced by um, what you hear from a particular supplier. And those, those issues are relevant in however you carry out soft market testing, but it shouldn't be a reason for not doing it. It's a case of thinking about how you um, manage that process as you move through. So there's an express permission to conduct that exercise. You can speak to either market participants or experts in the area with a view to preparing or specifying your requirements, so preparing your procurement documents or specifying them. We have seen examples of where um, a particular supplier's specification has been lifted and shifted into procurement documents. Um, so always take care, and I appreciate that different institutions have different models in terms of centralised and devolved procurement setups, and that's probably a greater risk where um, you've got people in departments who are responsible for pulling together specifications and they're not necessarily checked um, by anybody centrally, centrally with that procurement um, understanding. So it's worth having some notes in guidance that you might have that goes out to your colleagues around the risks involved in that. As I said, in carrying out any soft market testing, it's important not to offend the general treaty principles of equal treatment, non-discrimination, transparency. Um, so thinking about how you mitigate any involvement you've had with the market. There isn't an obligation to go and speak to everybody in the market. Um, there's some old PPN guidance from 2012 which talks about doing pre-market engagement and those principles largely sort of reflect what the um, regulations are giving you sort of authority to go off and do expressly. I expect that that will be one of the areas of guidance that's yet to, that will be updated in due course but it hasn't actually happened yet with some greater clarity on how you might do that. But that guidance is quite clear that there's no obligation to speak to every single potential person. It's about speaking to a proportionate representative group of or suppliers, contractors within the market as you carry that out. The reason um, the reference to the treaty principles is important is that there is a provision in the regulations which says that you need to be aware of the prior involvement of suppliers in your setting out your requirement or how they've influenced the procurement that you're going on to run. That applies both in terms of pre-market engagement, 
but also with relation to your incumbent suppliers. And actually incumbent suppliers is probably where there's a, a bigger risk and a risk that's slightly harder to manage. And that's making sure that their involvement doesn't distort the competition. As part of the discretionary grounds for exclusion, there is an issue, um, but there is a ground now which relates to prior involvement and where there's been a distortion or a conflict of interest in relation to the procurement. So we do need to take some care to make sure that there isn't an issue arising as a result of market engagement activities that we as institutions organise, which then cause somebody to be excluded from a process later on. Now, don't get me wrong, regular market engagement speaking to suppliers doesn't mean that somebody's going to be in a position where they're excluded from participating in your process. It's about where there's an issue which influence, impacts on the competition and the fairness of your resultant procurement competition, that there might have to be a reason to exclude a bidder. And that would be after um, there'd been attempts to put measures in place to mitigate or remedy that perceived or actual um, impact on the competition. So there's lots that can be done, and it isn't simply a case of speaking to a supplier means that they'd be excluded from the process moving forward. In practical terms, if you are engaging with the market, things to think about when you start your procurement is providing some impact information as part of your procurement pack about what activities you did, what you learned, how that influenced the development of the procurement, giving that sort of summary to provide that information so everyone knows what has happened and um, how that's been set out, helps to avoid the issue of cutting and pasting um, large specifications, um, certainly, and ensuring that people have the appropriate time to actually absorb your requirements. So if you've had earlier conversations with somebody, would that have put them in an advantageous position to go off and get their ducks in a row ready to bid back in for your opportunity? Um, you obviously can't completely mitigate that extra time that someone may feel they've had, but certainly it goes to the reasonableness of any timescales that you set within your procurement as you're moving forward, and there's the overriding obligation that any timescales that um, are set meet minimum requirements and are also proportionate to the actual complexity of the, of the procurement opportunity and what's needed to do. For incumbent providers, there can be greater issues, and it's worth thinking about whether really they're the people you'd be looking to to help influence the development of the specification. There's a natural tension in that. If you've got co-located service providers, do you need to put information barriers in place around the procurement that you're um, setting up? Do you need to maybe move how the procurement's being managed in the, any meetings in relation to that out of that co-located site? There can be quite a lot of pressure where you've got um, officers sitting next to providers and um, them having to prepare a procurement whilst also a potential bidder being sat next to them in the same room. It, it does happen frequently, so just an issue to be alive to. Getting your documents ready. Um, it sounds quite an innocent statement, but it's one of the um, changes to the regulations that's causing the biggest amount of um, head scratching. In effect, there is um, a much bigger push on transparency and shifting the procurement timetable um, through the new directives and regulations. And certainly Cabinet Office have been very keen to get the message across that in the UK we, we spend our time doing the wrong things. We spend far too long in the procurement process, not enough time preparing for it, probably not enough focus on actually the contract management aspects and learning and informing our, procure, our, our ongoing procurement cycle for the next time through the existing contract opportunity. And one of the things we now need to do is have our contract documents, uh, procurement documents ready from when the OG contract notice or a PIN which is being used as a call for competition is published in the OG. So in terms of an open procedure, that's quite straightforward. We had to have everything ready at any, in any event. Your tender document, your potential selection questions within that, they were all good to go from the off. I um, don't know about you, but a lot of the restricted procedures I would have been involved in would have been a case of going out with your PQQ. You then spend that PQQ period desperately writing the rest of your tender documents, finalising your evaluation criteria, setting your questions for tender stage, and those would run in parallel. And effectively, that is no longer what can happen. When we go out with those notices, we need to have our documents ready for the entire process. We need to be really clear to the market. They're not required to fill them in and return them at that point in time when they're first expressing their interest with their PQQ response. They're just there for information at that point in time. So people can see the full breadth of the procurement. Hopefully it'll help address... Yep. Do you have to have a very pin? Not, the pin not, not a pin if it's just being used as a general information notice, but you can now use in certain procedures a pin as a call for competition. So you can start effectively trigger your procurement with the PIN rather than specifically using a contract notice. Um, so in those circumstances, it needs to be ready from that point in time. 
the greater complexity comes in relation to some of the iterative processes. So if you're doing competitive dialogue, competitive procedure with negotiation, those processes um, which have potentially down selection stage. Yep. Okay, so with a restricted procedure, it's a two-step procedure. Yeah. You express your interest yeah. with your PQQ response. You as an organisation then select your shortlist for people to respond back. And at that point, those people who are shortlisted are invited to submit their tenders. Right, so you don't have to take, send the whole pack back, we just do the PQQ. Absolutely, because if they were sending everything back, we're effectively defaulting to the open procedure. Yeah. So it still remains a two-step process. And I think there's... Portals and things might be quite useful because effectively you need to make sure that the actual tender response fields aren't active during that PQQ response to avoid people sort of trying to submit their tender responses when actually they're only required to do the selection elements. There might be some ways that the technology you use can help that. Um, but I can anticipate there will be times where bidders see a load of documents that need responses and they'll be overly keen and desperate to fill things in. We don't want to be receiving pricing information back that would come back as part of a tender when we're doing selection. Because whilst we can, the best will in the world, we can say we've not looked at that, it hasn't influenced our shortlisting stage, there could be some issues of transparency and potential well, perceived issues of preference or um, negative um, marking that goes along with having received those documents up front. So it's where you're doing a restricted process, you need some really big clear warnings that as to what specific documents have to be provided at what time. So there is some potential for confusion, um, but it's intended to be sort of an informative step by providing everything up front. <coughs> Procurement documents is very widely defined. It's in the actual definition sections at the start of the regulations, and it effectively says things like award criteria, proposed conditions for contract, um, descriptive documentations, and any other thing relevant to the procurement. So <laughs> fairly all-encompassing. Um, don't get me wrong, it, I will see times, I can see, I can think of examples where there might be something that's going to come up that will need to be provided once you've started your procurement because it's just unavoidable. And I, I think we all need to be practical and remember that proportionality is obviously um, an obligation we work to under the regulations and think carefully about whether we still keep the best information to the bidders. So if something changes, or obviously not in a substantial way, there's some minor change that happens during the course of the process. You need to update information, particularly before the tender period. There's still a possibility to update that information moving forward, but just need to be clear about what needs to be ready um, when you start your process. So really, your whole timetabling for procurements will change significantly. An awful lot of work has to happen before we go live. We don't have that running in parallel and flexibility that would have been there before. In terms of competitive dialogue or competitive procedure with negotiation, or indeed the innovation partnership um, procedure, there is obviously um, more stages to that, and it's more challenging to think about actually settling your evaluation criteria before you, or the very specific questions you're going to ask as part of final tenders, before you go live with your procurement. In that situation, um, certainly I think a fair interpretation of the regulations is that we want to be having the um, initial stage of that dialogue, the, so an outline solutions or an interim bids position to be set out and clearly um, included within your document pack at the start of the procurement. However, actually your final tender questions, you might not have those flushed out in full detail and that might be something that gets updated through the course of the procurement, obviously before you actually go into that further competition, that further round of dialogue which will then lead to the final tenders. The evaluation criteria, the high-level evaluation criteria, um, excuse me, do need to be, I would recommend that they do need to be set out at the start of the process um, so that there isn't any changing of those criteria from the off. Right, 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 just of course. Question, the, the key to this matter is it says procurement documents must be ready and available, but it doesn't say all procurement documents must be ready and available. I wonder if you could perhaps address yeah, that. Yeah, it doesn't say all procurement documents, I, but I, <laughs> procurement legislation is interpretively or purposefully interpreted, and I think it's quite clear from certainly the preamble to the directive and um, the, the change in other provisions, so the reduction in the time limits, the information about reporting and how we're supposed to have things sort of ready electronically, 
I struggle to see a strong argument which says you only go live with what you've got. So if we haven't done our IT, t our tender documents yet, we're okay. I'd be very nervous about that as an approach. I'm sure there will be people out there taking a risk on it and you know, there are other factors in play with complete procurement compliance and it's a case of balancing risk for you as an organisation when you're moving forward to your procurement. Um, something to bear in mind is that if we aren't going out with all the documentation when we start the procurement, is it would likely be found to be a pre-existing breach. So in the jumping really far ahead, if somebody's looking to challenge a decision you've made and they're looking to see whether they've got any of the grounds for an effectiveness available to them, and there's also been a problem with your standstill letter, ground one of in ineffectiveness would possibly come into play because that would be a pre-existing breach in the process. So it's worth being alive to. I think another area where this could become live as an issue is in the context of ERDF and other EU funded projects. There is, for anyone who's been through an ERDF audit, you'll be aware of the administrative breaches of procurement and the quite wide ranging ways in which clawback can be applied. For example, missing um, the publication of a contract award notice by a few days or a day even, or having um, <coughs> small, fairly administrative errors in terms of calculating the number of days your tender period is open for your PQQ period can result in clawback of funding where there's an ERDF or similar EU audit. And I think this is another area which could fall into that administrative error type of issue. So I think if you're doing an ERDF or EU funded project, it's certainly a key issue to be aware of where we're trying to be very, very... It's not an issue which I think necessarily prejudices people provided we've got a fair chunk of the information. Um, within it. Okay. Any other questions on that before I move on? <coughs> Just about um, this standardised PQQ for SMEs that's come out. I'm going to come on to that if that's all okay. Right. Is that all right? Processes largely remain the same. Um, there's some tweaks around the naming of the competitive procedure with negotiation. So effectively, that would have been the old negotiated procedure with prior notice, competitive dialogue some tweaks in the wording to competitive dialogue. So if you look at the um, what can be permitted changes during tender stage and preferred bidder stage, there's a slight tweak in the wording. There's an argument that it's slightly more liberal in what it allows you to do now um, versus what was permissible under the 2006 regulations. And innovation partnerships are, is a new p procedure. Effectively trying to deal with the issue of the R&D ex exemption under the 2006 regulations, which allowed you to award a contract for research and development of products or services, but didn't then allow you to purchase those. So an innovation partnership is really intended to do that, but is for genuinely innovative and new products where there isn't something out on the market. The grounds for selecting the use of competitive dialogue and competitive procedure with negotiation are now the same. There were slight differences before, and again, there's a slight relaxation of those are slightly more permissible. Um, than would have previously been the case. Timescales, um, they're slightly shorter when you look at the minimum timescales. I won't dwell on these too much because of time, um, and you'll see within the slides that there is a, a set out of all those minimum timescales, and just remembering, of course, that there's an overriding obligation to ensure that they are appropriate um, in the nature of your process. Division into lots. You now need to consider whether your contract opportunity should be put into lots. This is part of the SME agenda and making sure that opportunities are made as widely available as possible. You don't have to put your opportunity into lots. If you don't do so, then you need to include an explanation of that in the Regulation 84 report. And that's something I'll talk about um, as we move forward as well. With lots, you can... Yeah. You, it would, I would do it on the basis of each lot because each lot is an individual contract and the obligation to publish a contract award notice relates to the award of a contract rather than the procurement itself. So I think there's some flexibility under that. Similarly, if you were awarding a contract to more than one supplier, you would have under a, con, under a single lot or under you know, a multi-supplier framework. If your contracts are awarded at different dates, Again, that would be an individual trigger for those opportunities. And given that we're now down to 30 days for publishing a contract award notice, I think it's really something to be very alive to, and um, those dates and timelines there as well. 
explain what I'm going to say. What I'm going to suggest is that is is possibly I'm talking about a national contract. Um, it's quite a complex set of services that we're tendering for, but we also want to do it in regional lots. So so the it's broken down into um, five different lots technically, and within each lot there might be three regional areas. Is that a possibility? I think well. <laughs> I think they would just be lots rather than, I think we might think of them as sublots as we were structuring our procurement. So for ourselves, we know that we want cleaning services, for example, and we want a north, south and east category. As they're advertised, cleaning is the sort of service, but then you'll have north, south and east as your lots. Yeah. Um, and you might then also have catering as part of that overall opportunity, but they're still separate lots. There is some complexity in terms of awarding lots now because you can take a view that notwithstanding the fact you've set out individual evaluation criteria for each lot, you can take a view and decide whether there is advantage in awarding a single contract to having lotted everything in the first place. You still need to have evaluation criteria which allows you to deal with that and I think it's going to be pretty challenging to come up with something that's fair and justifiable and it could largely undermine the SME agenda which this is the point that's trying to address if we give people the opportunity to bid for smaller contracts but then we get to step back and effectively say we think there's better for value for money if we actually award it in one go so there's some challenges and I think there could be some procurement challenges around that if a decision is taken I think you need to be quite confident um, that there's transparency in your process and that things have been handled objectively. Is that okay? On that point in particular if you're looking to actually do um, a take a step back and look at the process in the round and decide whether there's more ad um, a greater advantage or better value for money or whatever it may be in awarding a single contract having lotted your opportunity. I think putting some um, explanations and worked examples within your procurement documents to show how your evaluation could in theory work would be quite important because people will just struggle to understand the potential impact on their bid. So if I'm bidding for one lot out of three is my opportunity really still as part of that one lot or is it impacted on lots two and three, which are separate contracts in theory, something I can't influence. So there's some challenges there around managing that, but in theory, you have a lot more flexibility um, in moving that forward. So just reminders there. Law Jung's requirements. Um, one of my favourite sections of the new regulations. I split this out into two sort of key slides. Firstly, um, obligations related to above threshold contract opportunities where you have an above threshold contract opportunity, then you, you will obviously be publishing in the OG your um, invitation to participate in that process. So whether it's by contract notice or a pin notice, with, um, a pin notice as an invitation as a call for comp competition, then where you've published that notice, you also have to publish one in the Contracts Finder website. I appreciate that there are some challenges using that at the moment. Um, so there are some practicalities around there. You need to take care not to publish at a national level, i.e. on Contracts Finder or on your own website, um, before you've done your OG notice. So you send your notice off, you um, wait back to know it's gone live, but there is a deemed publication time, so if you haven't heard back because there's a bit of a backlog in Luxembourg, then um, you, ca you don't have to wait ad item in order to get that opportunity on Contracts Finder. You can do it after 24 hours need to have um, reference to Cabinet Office guidance on qualitative selection. Cabinet Office have now issued a standard PQQ. Um, questions as to whether that itself is burdensome, excessive or disproportionate in terms of its questions. Need to take some care there. We now, um, it's from the 1st September this year, so earlier last week, there is the obligation to report to Cabinet Office where we deviate from their PQQ in an above threshold procurement. So the Cabinet Office guidance that came out talked about reportable deviations. There's no sanction which goes along with having made a deviation. So don't be, I would say don't be scared of making one. If it's appropriate to your procurement process, then do make one. Remember that you don't have to do a PQQ, even in above, procure, above threshold procurements. It may or may not be appropriate. You don't have to do the full PQQ. Think about what's relevant. You might... You might not really be worried about the robustness of somebody's financial position in a particular procurement, but you might really care about their health and safety record or vice versa. Think, think about what is appropriate for you and just remember that the Cabinet Office PQQ comes with questions, not evaluation criteria. So that still needs to be factored in to um, your documentation. Once you've completed your procurement process, you found your supplier, your contractor, 
um, you'll obviously be under your obligation to publish your contract award notice. Similarly, you then need to publish a contract award notice within um, the Contracts Finder website as well. Below threshold procurements, um, this is a section um, which obviously doesn't come from the directives, so both the above threshold and um, below threshold obligations um, to do with Lord Young don't actually re and contracts finder don't actually relate to the directors at all. This is a UK um, additional set of requirements. So in below threshold procurements, whereas a subcentral um, institution, so a university, a non-central government body, you're subject to a £25,000 limit threshold where you're doing a contract above that and you are advertising that opportunity, then you're required to advertise that on Contracts Finder as well. Advertising and what amounts to advertising is obviously a bit of an interesting um, point under this. Advertising isn't a case of picking up the phone and speaking to a few suppliers and saying, could you tell me what your pricing would be for this? I think it's going to be in the region of £50,000. Can you give me a, a quote? That's not advertising. Advertising has to be slightly more wide, it has to be wider than that. It's not using a framework. So just thinking carefully about what you are setting there, um, how you're actually approaching your procurement is obviously quite important. The guidance that's been issued to support this um, doesn't track brilliantly with the wording of the regulations. It but says, doesn't quite so much imply, it actually says that if you have a higher threshold that you use internally, then apply that to the advertisement threshold. The regulations don't say that, they set a specific threshold and they don't say, or any other such threshold that you may choose to submit, your, to select yourselves as institutions. So just I think some care needs to be taken there in around the threshold that you're working to. Below threshold procurement, there is an abolition of a pre-qualification stage as part of a below threshold procurement. So we shouldn't be doing a two-stage process. You are still permitted to uh, um, assess suitability of organisations. So you might ask selection type questions, but it isn't um, a stage which you down select those people who might be interested in tendering for your opportunity. Once you've awarded, again, similarly, you need to publish a contract award <coughs> notice within Contracts Finder, and that needs to be within a reasonable time of your award. I am aware of some institutions are taking a view that as to what a reasonable period might be and actually saving all, all those up into one go and publishing them um, on a however frequent basis. There isn't the opportunity to do a bulk upload at the moment on the Contracts Finder website, but that might be something that's going to change. Light touch regime, um, Part B services in the old 2006 regime no longer exist in the new 2015 regime. Of course. There is, um, I can't remember exactly what the wording is. I think there is a reference to value, but value isn't necessarily the same as price. Um, so it just really depends on, on the information that you have available. There isn't always a contract value, um, a specific price that's available to publish. There is an overriding obligation that you don't disclose commercially sensitive information. There's a tension within procurement as to whether pricing is commercially sensitive and the timing for which it would be commercially sensitive. And there's various cases that relate to freedom of information requests and how that, how that can be managed. Um, so the regulation itself does set out what it sort of expects. Name a contractor, whether it's an SME or a VS, VCSE, um, so voluntary community or social enterprise. Um, but there usually is an expectation something to do with price. And obviously to demonstrate that it was a below threshold procurement there'd be an expectation that there's an idea that the price is certainly going to fall within, with under the um, relevant OG threshold. But if it's above threshold, you can say, you can give a range in your OG reward notice, um, but is that something that you could do with um, because if it's goods, you know, you do know there is a price and that could be seen to be commercial and confidential. Um, so can you not put something in that field? I don't know how they, I don't know specifically how that, that, that's working. I don't have access to Contrast Finder as not being a contracting authority myself. So it's not something I, I know at the moment. I can certainly try and find out for you. I um, don't know if anyone in the rooms had a go at uploading a Contracts Finder award notice yet. Yep. No, you didn't, you didn't have to put the figure in. It wasn't mandatory. Yeah. 
One second. I'll see if I can multitask. No, that might be a challenge. I'll come back to you at the end if that's okay. I'm just really conscious of how we are for time. Sorry, can I just ask the question about the PQQ again? Yeah. I'll be absolutely clear, everybody has to use that PQQ now. You don't have to do a pre-qualification. If you are doing a pre-qualification, your cabinet office guidance, the cabinet office ca pre-qualification questionnaire has to be used. If you're changing it, you need to report that to the cabinet office where there's a reportable deviation. Okay, but you, you can you can set the the um, evaluation criteria against their questions. You can weight those. Absolutely, so but there isn't any evaluation criteria set against them. It's yeah. some high-level questions we section. Have used, we have used it. In, it's especially because we wanted to encourage SMEs, but the document itself. It's a bit cumbersome. It's not the easiest to use. And don't get me wrong, reformatting it isn't going to be a reportable deviation. Having a think about how some of the guidance within it is set out, it's not going to be a reportable deviation. I mean, I've certainly tried to strip out some of the wording that's within it and okay, put that in. I think provide... It's very legalistic, isn't it? I've ensured that the messages that within it are within the documentation, but are just at a more... Um, it pulled out within the yeah definitely make it friendlier so given that there's no evaluation criteria set out there a lot of that sort of wordy sections sit within better within an evaluation section but fundamentally the documents that the same information is still conveyed within your procurement so we could work with the solicitor for instance to make it absolutely yeah absolutely you have to um there's an email address where you report into them. <laughs> there isn't a sanction set out. It's, it's a reporting process. Um, obviously, there's been some changes to the Mystery Shopper Scheme this year. Rather than just being a reactive service, it's now a proactive. We can go off and roam and look at your documents generally. Um, one of the growing areas of central government, I suppose you might say. Um, and I, I don't know, I'm purely speculating, but if we're reporting deviations into them, it might mean that they start to look at things that we're doing. Um, obviously, within the PQQ, there is a section where you can set out bespoke questions which relate to your procurement, so you still have flexibility to make sure the right questions are being asked for your process. So it's not a complete straitjacket. That section where you can ask appropriate questions is relatively permissive. Um, I don't think they make it clear that you can actually reformat it in a friendlier way. Um, well, certainly, my, uh, certainly the approach we've taken, uh, it's, it's not an amend, you know, it's got to be put within the context of the documentation that's going out. Right, okay. And it's, not a it's certainly not a complete document as it stands, so there has to be amendments <coughs> made to it to make sure it's appropriate to your procurement. Like touch regime, um, Part B services are no more. Um, Set out within Schedule 3 is a list of services which now fall to the light touch regime. It is a more restrictive list than the Part B list. So don't assume if something was Part B before, it's now within the light touch regime under Schedule 3. Very sadly for me, um, the miscellaneous category doesn't quite work as it used to. Um, miscellaneous was um, an interestingly used category for services under the old regime and some things which quite clearly fell within Part A were often listed as being a miscellaneous service. Now the miscellaneous service actually <coughs> section lists two specific CPV codes, blacksmith services and tyre moulding. So if anyone needs those, let me know and I will send you a bottle of champagne because quite frankly I'm not sure they're going to be the highest due services within um, the CPV listings. And you need to be spending more than £625,000 on them to actually have to procure them in the first place. So do take care in checking that the, the, the service that you need is a, is a light touch regime service. And it's done by specific CPV codes rather than very broad titles, so genuine care needed there. It means that we have a formal regime for conducting those above threshold service opportunities. So previously, if you were a Part B service, there was very procedural obligations under the PCR 2006. There's now a process that has to be followed. It isn't a prescribed process. You don't have to go off and follow the open restricted or one of the other named procedures. You have to do a process which involves a call for competition. So there's an advertisement in OG, and similarly there'd be an advertisement on Contracts Finder. You then need to do a process which is transparent and fair. It includes conditions for participation, it'll include award criteria, and it'll include time limits to which people have to respond. You need to follow standstill obligations. <coughs> 
and you need to publish a contract award notice. As far as I'm aware, most people are approaching this on the basis of an open or restricted um, procurement because A, you're familiar with them as organisations and B, the market are familiar with them. The guidance issued by Cabinet Office does say, effectively, go be creative, don't feel constrained to those processes. And I think that's a really valid argument. But sometimes um, it may feel like reinventing the wheel for the sake of reinventing the wheel. Um, so some care needs to be taken there. Where I've seen some tweaks are people being a little bit more liberal with time limits and again providing that that's proportionate to the opportunity and also um, potentially involving a bit of a, a dialogue, a mini dialogue phase where there's particular points which need to be thrashed out. There's a bit more flexibility to do that. If it's below 625,000, then it's a below threshold opportunity. So your Lord Young below threshold opportunity and um, below threshold requirements will apply. But otherwise, you don't need to worry about um, advertising in the OGU. Need to think about whether normally you'd need to think about whether there's cross-border interest and whether there still should be an obligation to do some sort of advertisement but the guidance and the preamble to the directive effectively says that where there is a threshold a contract opportunity below 625,000, unless there's concrete evidence to the contrary you can sort of safely assume that there isn't cross-border interest in an opportunity that's slightly less of an issue for us here in mainland uk because we don't really have those national border issues and um, it's a bigger issue potentially if you're based in Northern Ireland and you've got the Republic even just metres or miles down the road and you need to think about whether there's um, a cross-border interest in your opportunity there. So light touch regime was slightly more of the revolution in terms of changes to the procurement um, regime. Eligibility and assessment is um, minor changes by comparison, just evolution to those. There's an obligation now to check somebody's pre-qualification stage on an ongoing basis, so making sure you're not awarding to somebody who would, at that point in time, fail your PQQ. There's a general approach to moving towards um, PQQ being based on self-certification by the bidder, so they tell you they comply with what you need, they meet your minimum requirements, and then you only test those on the basis of the successful bidder. I think as organisations, that will probably take a bit of time to become a something we're comfortable with, so potentially just tendering with people who we haven't definitely checked to meet our requirements um, for fear that they trip up moving forward. There will be a, sing a European single procurement document which someone can effectively respond back and say, I have my ESPD, these are my credentials, and there'll be a central European repository for checking things in future. We're not quite there yet, these are all being developed at the moment, so it might be that we become more comfortable with um, self-certification as we move forward. There's definitely self wording on self-certification in the Cabinet Office PQQ. So if you're not doing self-certification, then that wording wouldn't be relevant to your Cabinet Office PQQ template. So just take care that that doesn't cause any confusion. Award criteria, there's um, some change in language around um, best price quality ratio, whereas we're obviously used to most economically advantageous tender. There's now um, a recognition that you can do life cycle costing rather than just a single price for a procurement. If you're doing life cycle costing, there's some guidance around the sorts of things you can consider and you need to be really careful around that, that the right people with appropriate technical qualifications are assessing, um, taking an assessment on that rather than a sort of putting our finger in the air and, and guessing on a lot of those costs. So some careful review needed there. Um, just another point to note that there's now greater clarity that you can use social and environmental characteristics and criteria as part of your award. If you're doing that, that needs to be something that's been flagged up in your OGU notice from the off. So you need to make reference to the fact that there's going to be evaluation on the basis of social and environmental characteristics. The OGU notices are likely to be updated in the next couple of years. It might be something that there's a specific box put in in future, but at the moment there isn't anything in there which references that specifically. There is a box which talks about particular conditions, so you could put it in there or put it in the additional information section. Reference contract award notices already. The timescale to publish has been dropped down to 30 days. There isn't a requirement to publish in the OGU for call-offs under frameworks. Arguably, there is to do so under the Lord Young Contracts Finder obligations because that just talks about a publicly awarded contract, not one that has been advertised. For dynamic purchasing systems, there's been a slight slimming down of the administrative um, obligations, so you can group those together, but you do still need to publish. Individual reports, again, this is all about improved traceability and accountability within procurement. A lot of this language is really address, trying to um, address some wider procurement non-compliance, which 
I could possibly slightly controversially say can be more of an issue on the continent than on mainland UK. Um, there are differing extents to which member states comply with procurement law as reflected by the sorts of nations that come up when a lot of the cases are being taken forward. Um, so some of this seems quite heavy handed potentially for the UK, um, but we need to record and document a lot more of what we're doing. Regulation 84 talks about all the different things we should be recording through the process. This is going to be a living, breathing document which reflects the key decisions and the rationale for those that we've been making along the way. There is a lot of information that gets recorded there. Um, as a lawyer, the thing that comes to my mind is that in the event of a challenge or a potential challenge, if I was acting for a bidder, the first thing I'm going to be asking for is your copy of your Regulation 84 report. Putting my contracting authority hat on, I'm obviously going to be resisting disclosure of that and certainly thinking about what I can justifiably withhold on the basis of um, commercial sensitivity or some of the other justifications that might exist. But if proceedings are issued, it is undoubted that this will be a document which will be disclosable. Take care in terms of the electronic communication obligations and not to have oral communications with bidders. You can have some oral communications, but they should not relate to not should not have a substantial impact on the contract opportunity. And we should be taking care that it doesn't give somebody an advantage over another. They need to be documented in some way. Um, I'm aware of some contracting authorities taking the approach with bidder days now to actually record those, either audio or video file, and disclose that as part of their procurement pack or make it available to anyone who didn't actually um, attend. Taking a note of the fact that you need to maintain records for three years, longer if you've been doing a European funded process, so just keeping those points up to date. Um, modification of contracts. I'm going to talk to this very quickly because I'm conscious that time is now definitely against us. Um, modification of contracts. You can modify contracts providing it's not substantial or it comes within one of the safe harbours set out in Regulation 72. And that relates to where there is no substantial change to the contract. Um, another example might be where there's a clear, precise, and unequivocal review clause within your contract which permits the change. The small value changes, so where the change has a value impact of less than 10% in relation to goods or services, or 15% in relation to a works contract. There's options to extend where there's no financial impact, but you could not, as a reasonable and diligent authority have identified that that was going to be an issue in the first place. Take some, some careful analysis needed when you're looking to rely on these. A number of them require you to publish a notice in the OJU after you've made the modification. So you make the change and then you tell the world that you've done it and that you're justifying it on the basis that it comes within one of the safe harbours of Regulation 72. There isn't a standalone notice for that at the moment. Again, it's one of the notices I expect to be introduced in the next few years. So at the moment, using a contract award notice effectively again um, is really the only way to manage that. Um, you can't really do an addendum to a contract award notice, so issuing a new one and then linking it back through using the, the option to put in cross-references to the relevant um, prior notices would be important. You need to think carefully about changes to a tender process. Although this um, Regulation 72 is obviously talking about um, changes to an awarded contract, some of those provisions will be sort of appropriate to consider in relation to changes you might need to make mid-process. Um, but again, you've more flexibility when you're still mid-process and thinking about whether you need to roll back or re-advertise will obviously be relevant in those circumstances. And being alive to the fact that in the event that your modification is not permitted and it's beyond the scope of Regulation 72, the Regulation 73 um, includes a termination right. So if it's not in your contract at the moment, it would be deemed into your contract. Some care needed around all of this because um, if you terminate a contract, there might still be grounds for your um, contractor to come back and challenge. So having a look at what your contracts say around termination and certainly looking to get um, hold harmless provisions involved and that's important. If you're making a change which is, an, is likely to be a significant change and not within the safe harbour, then the procurement world says you should be retendering that opportunity. That's the position. Um, so if you're carrying on and awarding in that circumstance, um, it's appropriate to have um, a side agreement, so a collateral agreement with the bidder, um, so with your contractor, to say what would happen in the event of a challenge. Yeah. In case of an extension, will it be considered as a... Uh, Potentially. Um, if, it's a, if, it's an, if it's been something that was provided for as part of your initial contract opportunity, so you're doing a contract which is three years plus an extension to award for two, 
No, that's unlikely to be a sub substantial modification. If you've had a contract which is three years plus two years and you've already exercised that extension and then you extend it again and again, then we're getting into the realms of, of thinking whether that's a substantial modification. So some care needed. And it's the, it's the easy way that it happens. We just roll on and on and on. Um, it's typically where those change, rather than just changing the scope, scope creep is also another area or you're delivering this service, can you extend to deliver this? Or you're delivering, you're building this building for us, do you mind doing that one next to it as well? And without those being thought through, there can be some real risk. The cost impact is within 10% of the world. There's some wording that goes around that, but as a rule of thumb, it's 10% on goods and services, but take some care in applying that. And again, that there's cumulative impacts of changes that have happened through the course of the contract, so just being careful. We don't always see the full scope of changes that have happened, and we just get the big questions put to us, and then actually it turns out there's been lots of smaller changes previously during the life of that contract. So robust contract management needed, and um, some clear guidance given to your colleagues um, who go off and actually manage the contracts once they've um, been carefully awarded in the first place. Draft, I'm um, slightly over time. Um, I think this is a break just now, so are you happy for me to carry on for a few minutes? Just very quickly. Um, draft concessions regulations, not a tremendous amount to say on them. Um, concessions opportunities are those where the remuneration to the service provider or the works provider doesn't come from you directly as a, as a procuring entity. Um, so a typical example might be a catering opportunity where you're saying, I specifically need a catering service but you get your remuneration by charging people for what they buy in the shop or the cafe or whatever it might be. Um, or in terms of a works opportunity, which is probably less relevant to university, but there might be some situations where it comes up, potentially leisure facilities, where you say, um, go build, you know, H um, the M6 toll road was a concession opportunity, build the road and then charge people to go on it. That's a works concession um, rather than a services. A leisure would be one where you think about building a new sports centre and then charge people, then run it and charge people to use it. So you need to think about whether the higher value sits within services or works. But then, and that would have been a bigger issue before because under the 2006 regulations, works um, concessions were regulated, but services weren't. Services were just subject to um, the European Commission communication on contracts otherwise excluded. So there's now a clearer regulation. The threshold is a, effectively puts it into the value of high value contracts. So those above um, 5.186 million euros. That won't, it's highly unlikely to be the exact threshold um, by the time the contracts, concessions regulations come alive because there will be an updating to thresholds towards the end of this year and the concessions contracts aren't going to come in until April next year. So can I ask for a brief question how that, that figure will be calculated? Yeah, so if you're not paying yeah. something to the supplier, yeah. how that threshold or how the value of the contract will be... Um, it's the, it's, it's the value of the opportunity. So um, in a catering model, it's what is the likely revenue, to, revenue that they're going to take in that opportunity over the time. There'll be some guidance, that I think, that sits around that. But effectively, that's what we're looking at. What's the value just now to that opportunity? Um, so similarly, if it wasn't a full... Con I mean, in concessions, you can subsidise partially. The cost of it, so I appreciate subsidised lunches for your academics probably aren't something that exists in the same way these days. Um, but if you were doing that, it would be the revenue from the prices charged plus the, the subsidy that would go to that part. It's all forms of remuneration. It's quite widely scoped. Um, so for anything that's got any significant length of time, there is, there is possibility to hit that value quite quickly. The directive... Um, wording is effectively being pulled straight through into the draft concessions regulations. There isn't um, a reviewing and rewriting of those. It's, it's just a straight pull through. So looking at the directive, you see the clear direction of travel for the regulations. Um, there's not a requirement to follow one of the mandated procedures, open, restricted, etc. There's just a do a fair process. So a little bit like the light touch regime, but important to note that the remedies for failing to comply are consistent with the public contract regulations. Obviously, it's harder to um, breach something where you have to do it in a fair manner than have the specific procedural steps um, that go along as well. But it's, it's important to note that those remedies could be sought. Consultation is ongoing at the moment, closes on the 18th of September. So anyone with a free weekend who'd like to have a little read, it's not overly long. There's only very few questions um, that have been identified for response. Effectively, the consultation that was done for the public contract regulations a year ago, those policy decisions that were made then are being applied through where they're appropriate.
Trends and legal challenges. Um, just really to flag up a couple of areas where we still see a lot of issues, both in terms of courts and the sorts of things that we get asked about on a, a de quite literally a day-to-day -day basis. Um, there was a question earlier this year about the fact that the significant rise in court fees, whether that would impact or not upon um, the amount of challenges. Not really seen people be put off just yet. If someone's so motivated that they're going to challenge the difference, say, between a £2,000 court fee and a £20,000 court fee, hasn't really been a determining factor in the challenges that I've seen come forward. There's still an inherent re reluctance on the part of bidders to um, actually go as far as challenging by issuing court proceedings. It doesn't mean they don't want to sort of push you as contracting authorities to provide more information or explanation around certain decisions. Um, but there is still a, a lot of not quite willing to pull the trigger on um, a procurement challenge. That said, there are obviously a lot of them that are happening and they have increased in number over the last few years. So common issues that are coming up, it's in relation to later incomplete tenders would be one area. Um, Later in complete tenders, the position would ordinarily have been, and while you're still working through on procurement started under 2006 regulations, it's what did you say in your documents about how you were going to manage that? Did you say that a late tender would be excluded or would not be permitted to be evaluated? Or did you say it may be um, evaluated? In the former situation, then you'd be at risk if you allowed someone into the process. If you allow a late tender in, it then wins on your evaluation. And I'm, I'm your number two bidder and I was in on time. And it, by all other ways, I'm second in that process. I'm disadvantaged if that number one bidder who was late has won. If you've got discretion, then you're permitted to exercise it. But you need to think carefully about exercising that discretion. Again, if I'm your number two tenderer and you've exercised that discretion, is that fair to me? Is, do I have an argument there as well? So just being alive to those points, I think, is quite key. Just because somebody's annoyed that they haven't got their tender in on time does not mean you need to instantly allow them through. Incomplete tenderers under the new regulations is going to be quite interesting because we have the new very delightful regulation 56.4, which says that you can go out and clarify and seek additional information. So if something's missing within a tender, you can rely on that to now seek it. I still think some care will be needed in exercising that discretion because it similarly comes down to if you've excluded somebody who failed to um, submit their tender on time so that it effectively it was an incomplete tenderer and then you allow somebody to give you something you didn't that they didn't have at the point in time they tendered there's a bit of an equal treatment issue there so just being alive to how you um, address that and making sure you you think about what it actually says in your tender documentation always go to that as your first point of call um, in assessing whether or not you've got the discretion to go on and check we still see a lot of pushback from bidders wanting more information on um, standstill letters if you have genuinely complied with your obligations under the regulations to um, provide characteristics and reasons and for the decision and characteristics and relative advantages, then you shouldn't be under an obligation to, any to provide anything more. It is amazing how poor standstill letters can often be. I do have a lot of sympathy with bidders in, uh, on occasions when I'm seeing standstill letters that are issued. Um, there's no real justification for reasonings a lot of the time. I think it's really easy to overlook the fact that it's effectively three parts to that obligation. Reasons for the decision, well, that usually comes down to the scores themselves, and we provide the score of the successful tenderer, the score of the unsuccessful tenderer. So the fact that those total scores are different kind of leads to your decision relatively easily. Characteristics are things that were in the successful tenderer's bid, so being clear as to what was identified within that bid. And then the relative advantages is the comparison between the person who was unsuccessful and the person who was successful. So they're effectively bespoke to each letter that you're sending out. I appreciate its time. I appreciate that it's hassle. But there is an obligation to get that done. If we're not doing complete standstill letters, then our standstill period is not effective. So we're always at risk of an ineffectiveness claim. So there is, there is reason in the madness for doing it all and getting it all done out clearly. Um, addressing any issues and, and giving people the opportunity to, to raise questions they may have. So the level of feedback you need to provide is simply that, the reasons for the decision, including the characteristics and relative advantages of the successful tenderer. We'd always recommend, um, well, we'd regularly recommend that you avoid debrief meetings. They tend to be problematic. Um, the only, person who can the only person who can lose in a debrief meeting is the contracting authority. Doesn't mean you always have a loser, but you guys are the only people who will ever come out badly from them because the bidder will only ever end up more informed to a lesser or greater extent. 
and you're the only person who can reveal information which could put you on a negative moving forward. So I appreciate that it's sometimes nice to do it from a supplier management perspective, but do take care before you do it and do make sure that the people who are doing them are properly briefed and really were part of the evaluation panel because they know what the decision was and they should very much be sticking to the script of the standstill letters that have gone out. There should be no new information provided in those um, sessions because you've obviously complied with your obligations already to provide that information. In writing standstill letters, um, thinking back to what the criteria were in the first place is quite helpful. So A, what you asked for and B, what you were setting out as the um, the thresholds and, and the scoring guidance, using that language, turning it back to people is quite helpful. Um, it helps you put out a consistent letter and one that um, is difficult to challenge um, by a bidder. Material change decisions of late, we've had two interesting ones, um, Gottlieb and Winchester City Council related to a major change to a awarded development contract. It was something that had never been procured in the first place and um, there were various changes to that through the years and that was ultimately challenged by way of judicial review and the decision to um, actually change that, that development agreement has now been quashed by the courts. Um, development agreements are an easy area for change and to building works contracts where there's substantial changes to those, it's a <coughs> controversial area. It was a judicial review because the challenger was a councillor and not a, another contractor, not another economic operator. Effectively plied the tests in presser text which have now been codified into Regulation 72. Eden Red was again a similar case around material change, um, extension of contract scope and was a very recent Supreme Court decision. In effect, that was decided on its facts that there was scope in the original contract opportunity for the change identified. Um, so definitely one, one that applies on its facts and there was very clear scope within both the original contract notice, the procurement tested the potential options for change and they were then contractualised in the opportunity. So the, I think the key message from this is simply putting something as an option in your original contract notice and then not testing that through the procurement wouldn't protect you. But if you identify potential options within your contract notice, test those within your procurement and then contractualise those, you'll have more flexibility to, um, um, to rely upon the scope and options of that contract moving forward. Brings me very quickly to the end. I appreciate I've overrun and I do thank everyone for their patience. Um, is there any further questions?